By the end of this one hour English lesson, you're going to improve your listening skills of fast English so you can better understand native English speakers. You'll also add common phrasal verbs, idioms, and expressions to help you sound just like a native speaker. Welcome back to J4S English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. Here's how this lesson will work. I'm going to say a sentence three times and you need to write down exactly what you hear in the comments. After, I'll explain what I said and I'll explain the pronunciation changes that take place in fast English and I'll explain the natural expressions that I used. Are you ready for your first listening test? I'll say it three times. She's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. She's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. She's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. I said she's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. Notice the contraction, she's. This is she is, the verb to be. Native speakers will always contract this, she's, she's. Let's talk about leaps and bounds. Notice how bounds, the D is not pronounced. Bounds, ns, bounds. And here when we have and between two words, you can reduce that just to n, n, leaps and bounds, leaps n, leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. She's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. Notice how you don't hear the H on him, than him, than him. But if we want to combine those sounds together and say it like one word, then him, then him, then him. Let's talk about what this means. She's more qualified than him. You understand that. When I add leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds, this is a modifier. It makes more qualified stronger. So it sounds like greatly more qualified, a lot more qualified. And it can also mean quickly if that's the context. But in this context, it's a modifier that means greatly. So you can say, I've improved my English by leaps and bounds by leaps and bounds. Here, notice how you have to include the word by. I've improved my English and you want to modify that improve to make it sound stronger. I've improved my English by leaps and bounds. So write that in the comments if you feel like my lessons are helping you improve your English by leaps and bounds. Jennifer, I've improved my English by leaps and bounds. Put that in the comments. It's leaps and bounds ahead of mine, Aww. which means you are just progressing by leaps and bounds. <laughs> Virtue Khan has grown by leaps and bounds. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. Is the agenda set in stone? Is the agenda set in stone? Is the agenda set in stone? I said, is the agenda set in stone? First, let's talk about the agenda. Notice how I let have that long E sound, the agenda, because agenda starts with a vowel. This is not a rule that native speakers always follow. I could equally say the agenda, the agenda, the agenda. So if you hear both, it's just not something a native speaker always does. Let's talk about set in stone. Notice we have a T between two vowels. So we can pronounce that T as a soft D, set, set in, set in, d, din. So I take that sound and I connect it to the next word in, and it sounds like din, d, d, din, set in, set in, set in stone. And I'll say all three of those words together because they're an expression. The expression is to be set in stone. In our example, the verb to be is, is. It starts the sentence because the sentence is in question form. Is the agenda set in stone? To be set in stone. 
When something is set in stone, in this case, the agenda, it's in a state that is very difficult, if not impossible to change. So the agenda could be set in stone because all the speakers are confirmed. You've booked the hotel room. You've already paid for the hotel room. People have already booked their ticket to come to the event. So it's difficult, if not impossible, to change any aspects of the agenda. It's set in stone. We commonly use this expression in the negative to say our plans aren't set in stone. If I say that to you, it means that I can change my plans. So perhaps I told you what my plans are and then you want to do something different. I can say, oh, don't worry. Our plans aren't set in stone. So it's saying I can change my plans. My plans are flexible. So you can use this both in the positive or the negative. Because nothing's set in stone. Oof. Set, set in stone. Uh, these nicknames, are they set in stone? Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. I was tossing and turning all night. I was tossing and turning all night. I was tossing and turning all night. Did you get this one? I said I was tossing and turning all night. We have and, so remember, same thing as before, tossing in, mm. I can change that to mm, mm, but I have to connect it to the word before, tossing in, tossing and turning. So I will say all three, tossing and turning as one word, tossing and turning, tossing and turning, mm, mm, tossing and turning. Now, commonly a native speaker will drop the G sound on tossing ing, and just say mm, tossin, tossin. I personally don't do this, but many native speakers do. Tossin, tossing, tossin. But same thing, you have that N mm sound, tossin and turnin, tossin and turnin, or like I said, tossing and turning, tossing and turning. The pronunciation is quite clear, but if you don't know what this means, you won't know how to communicate with a native speaker. I was tossing and turning all night. To toss and turn, this is used to say you had a very restless sleep and you were moving a lot. That is the tossing and turning. That's the movement. You were moving a lot while you were sleeping, so you had a restless sleep. If you were tossing and turning all night, it means you had a restless sleep, so it means right now you're tired. You could say, sorry, I'm yawning so much. I tossed and turned all night. And that means you had a terrible sleep, so now you're tired. That's what's got you tossing and turning. He's always tossing and turning. Man, then I spend all night tossing and turning trying to figure out what I should have said. Are you ready for your next listening exercise? I'll say it three times. Just give it a go and see. Just give it a go and see. Just give it a go and see. Did you get this one? I said, just give it a go and see. Let's talk about give it. We can combine these together and I'm going to use that v sound. Give it, vit, vit, give it, give it. So that's how I can say these two words as one, give it. And I'll do the same thing with a go. I'll just pronounce it as one word, a go. Give it a go. Give it a go, give it a go. Just give it a go and see. What does this mean? To give something a go simply means to try something. So if I say, just give it a go, I'm saying, just try it. Maybe your friend invited you to go dancing, but you don't know how to dance. I could say, just give it a go. Now here, the it 
is dancing. So I could say just give dancing a go. Just give dancing a go. Remember in the original example, it was just give it a go and see. Here the C represents and see what happens. See what happens when you try dancing. Maybe you are really good at it, or maybe you're not very good at it, but you had so much fun, you don't even care that you weren't good at it. So if you send me a message and say, Jennifer, I'm not sure if I can give a presentation in English, I'll say to you, just give it a go. So I want you to write in the comments right now, Jennifer, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Put that in the comments. Jennifer, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Let's give it a go. Let's give it a go and see what the future brings. Let's try this one more time. I'll say it three times. We have a lot riding on this pitch. We have a lot riding on this pitch. We have a lot riding on this pitch. I said, we have a lot riding on this pitch. Notice when I said the sentence fast, I did not contract we have. I didn't say we've a lot. We've a lot riding on this pitch. I didn't say that. I said we have. We have a lot riding on this pitch. That's because in American English, we do not contract have when have is the main verb. We only contract have when it's an auxiliary verb. I could change this and say we've got, we've got a lot riding on this pitch. In this case, have is the auxiliary verb, got is the main verb, so I can form that contraction. We have, we've, we've got, we've got a lot riding on this pitch. You're probably wondering what this means. When you have a lot riding on something, it means that something, whatever the something is, is extremely important to your success, whatever success means to you. Now, in this case, the something is this pitch. This pitch is extremely important to this person's overall success. What does this pitch mean? In the business world, a pitch is a presentation, but the purpose is to convince someone to do something or to buy something. So it's extremely important that this pitch, this presentation is successful. And it's extremely important for the person's overall success, likely their career success. To use a previous expression that you learned, I was tossing and turning all night thinking about this pitch. My career is riding on it. Everything is riding on it. Well, this is it, folks. Everything is riding on this pitch. So much rides on this. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice this pronunciation. So I'm going to say each sentence again, but I want you to say the sentence out loud and then we'll repeat that three times. So let's do that now. She's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. She's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. She's leaps and bounds more qualified than him. Is the agenda set in stone? Is the agenda set in stone? Is the agenda set in stone? I was tossing and turning all night. I was tossing and turning all night. I was tossing and turning all night. Just give it a go and see. Just give it a go and see. Just give it a go and see. We have a lot riding on this pitch. We have a lot riding on this pitch. We have a lot riding on this pitch. Amazing job. Think of how much you've learned already and we're just getting started. So let's keep going with the lesson. 
Remember, I'll say it three times. They've been bickering all day. They've been bickering all day. They've been bickering all day. Did you get this one? I said, they've been bickering all day. Let's talk about the pronunciation changes. Notice I have they've. This is a contraction. They have, they've, they've, they've. Native speakers use contractions in spoken English almost 100% of the time. So you need to be very, very comfortable hearing the contraction because it affects the grammar of the sentence. You need to have they have been bickering because that shows the grammar and the grammar is the present perfect continuous. So if you didn't have that, it would be grammatically incorrect. They've been bickering all day. Now notice I said been, been, a very unstressed been. This is how we pronounce the past participle of the verb be, been, in American English. I don't speak British English, but I believe in British English, they pronounce it more stressed, been, but in American English, we don't do that. We just say been, been, they've been, they've been bickering all day. Now to understand fast English outside of the classroom, you need to hear the individual words but you also have to understand the meaning of the words. So let's talk about the verb to bicker. This is when you argue about things that are not important. The concept of bickering is extremely common and everyone does it. And we usually do it with people we spend the most time with, our family, our spouses, husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, our close friends, our coworkers that we spend a lot of time with. Anytime you spend a lot of time with someone, it's common that you'll bicker. But it's different from fighting because when you're fighting with someone, usually there's a strong emotion involved, but when you bicker, you don't really have that emotion. It's less serious because the things you're arguing about, fighting about are not actually important. Like I said, this can be very common in the workplace when you spend a lot of time with your coworkers. So maybe you're in a meeting and you've been discussing an issue for hours with your coworkers but people start bickering. They start arguing about things that aren't important. You could say, we didn't get anything done today because we bickered all meeting. We argue, we bicker. Yeah, we bicker. <laughs> Either. Yeah, well, we were bickering because they were bickering. Mark, your kids are bickering. Let's try this again with another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. That street's pretty sketchy. That street's pretty sketchy. That street's pretty sketchy. How'd you do with this one? I said, that street's pretty sketchy. Did you hear that streets, the S? Well, that is the verb to be in a contraction form. The street is the streets. The street's pretty sketchy. Again, it's extremely important that you hear these contractions for grammar because we need the verb to be grammatically. The sentence would sound very awkward if you didn't have it because it would be grammatically incorrect. That street's pretty sketchy. Sketchy, 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 sketchy. Let's talk about to be sketchy. That street is our verb to be, to be sketchy. This is used to say that something is not completely safe. So by saying that street's pretty sketchy, I am saying that street doesn't look completely safe. I don't think that street is safe. So I'm saying we shouldn't go down that street. We should avoid that street. Now, why would I say this street is sketchy? This is an adjective that native speakers use a lot. If I say a street's sketchy, 
It's most likely because it's dark or lacks lighting. There aren't a lot of people around. There's broken glass or broken windows or there are a lot of abandoned buildings on that street. It could be all of those reasons or it could be just one of those reasons for me to say that street doesn't look safe, that street's pretty sketchy. I could say, let's take another street, this one looks sketchy. So I can also use the verb look, look sketchy, but I have to conjugate it, this street looks sketchy. Or let's say your friend or your husband or your wife came to you and said, hey, I heard this amazing business proposal today. All we need to do is invest $1,000 and we're guaranteed $100,000. And you could say, that sounds sketchy. So notice here, the verb is to sound sketchy. And you're saying the idea, the plan, the business proposal doesn't sound completely safe. We also use this to describe people. He's a sketchy guy or he's sketchy. She's sketchy. In this case, you're saying the person isn't safe, which means you can't trust the person. So with people, it's a way of saying, I don't think I can trust him. She's sketchy. He's sketchy. Seems a little sketchy. <laughs> you're kind of sketchy laundry to some sketchy laundromat? Let's try another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. You must have seen it. You must have seen it. You must have seen it. Did you get this one? You must have seen it. But notice, I didn't actually say have. I reduced that entirely to just a. Uh. You must a. Uh. You must uh. I could also reduce it to more of an of sound, which is very commonly done by native speakers. You must of. You must of. You must have seen it. Notice for seen it, I use that n, that n sound to connect the two words together. Seen it. Seen it. Seen it. So you hear a n in front of it. It sounds like knit. But if you say those two words together, it blends together. Seen it, seen it. You must have seen it. Now let's talk about the grammar of this. Must is a modal verb. And grammatically, you need must plus base verb, which is the verb without to. So grammatically, you need must have. In written English, you must use must have seen it because that's grammatically correct. But in spoken English, it will sound like must a uh, or must of. But in written English, if you wrote you must a uh, or of, it would be incorrect grammatically. So just remember what I'm explaining is for spoken English. You must have seen it 200 times. You must have seen it too, Claude. You must have seen them here. Yeah? Let's try this one more time. I'll say it three times. What's the ETA? What's the ETA? What's the ETA? I said, what's the ETA? Of course, we have what's. That's a contraction of what is. What's. What's the. Now, because ETA it begins with a vowel sound, E, I could say either the or the, because we do a more stressed the when the next word starts in a vowel, but this isn't a rule that native speakers follow all the time. But if I did a more stressed E in the, it would really blend together with E-T-A, the T-A, and it would almost sound like it's just one word, the T-A, because I wouldn't really repeat the E on E-T-A, the T-A. I believe in my example, when I did the listening test, I think the first time I did it more of the E-T-A, and the second time I did it more of the 
ETA and the sounds blended together. Let's listen to that again and see what I did. What's the ETA? What's the ETA? What's the ETA? Now, ultimately, either way that you pronounce it, the ETA or the ETA is fine. Now, you're probably wondering, well, what's ETA? This stands for estimated time of arrival. So your ETA, the ETA, or someone, some things ETA is the estimated time of arrival for that someone or something when it's expected to arrive. So let's say we're talking about a project and your boss wants to know when this project will arrive in his inbox or on his desk. He could say, what's the ETA? And he could just say the, if it's obvious you're talking about the project. He could say, what's your ETA? Because you're the one submitting the project. Or he could say, what's the project's ETA? So the ETA belongs to the project, so you need that possessive. What's the project's ETA? And they all have the same meaning. We commonly use this with friends or coworkers, family members, to let them know when we're going to arrive. So let's say you were supposed to be at your family's house at seven o'clock for dinner, but you're running late. You could send them a text message and say, running late, Google says my ETA is 6.42 or 15 minutes. Now Google says, because when you put something in a GPS, Google will tell you, or whatever you use, Google will tell you when you're expected to arrive. That's your ETA. What's their ETA? Okay, ETA? ETA, 11 minutes. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice your pronunciation as well. So I'm going to say each sentence again. And then I want you to repeat the sentence out loud and try to imitate my pronunciation as closely as possible. And I'll say each sentence three times. Let's do that right now. They've been bickering all day. They've been bickering all day. They've been bickering all day. That street's pretty sketchy. That street's pretty sketchy. That street's pretty sketchy. You must have seen it. You must have seen it. You must have seen it. What's the ETA? What's the ETA? What's the ETA? You are doing such a great job, but let's keep going and let's keep testing your listening skills. So let's start your first listening test. I'll say it three times. Careful with the blender, it's a little finicky. Careful with the blender, it's a little finicky. Careful with the blender, it's a little finicky. I said, careful with the blender. It's a little finicky. First, let's talk about the pronunciation changes. You can see here, it's, this is a contraction. It is, it's, it's a little, it's a little. So we pronounce that as a d, a soft d. Little, d, little, d, little, little. Now, some native speakers will drop those sounds entirely and it will just sound like lil, lil. And then we connect it with a, uh, a little, a lil, a lil. I personally pronounce the soft Ds, a little, a little. It's a little finicky. Finicky is probably a new word in your vocabulary. So let's focus on the sounds. Fin, ick, e. Now, we're going to put the syllable stress on the first sound, fin, finicky, finicky, finicky. What does this mean? Well, finicky, this is an adjective, to be 
finicky. And this means that something requires a lot of attention to detail. So the example is using a blender, a common household appliance that's easy to use. But if this blender is finicky, it means that to use it successfully, you have to really pay attention to detail. Maybe you have to make sure the lid is on in just a precise way or press the buttons in a very specific way in order for the blender to operate. Likely because the blender is very old or there's a problem with the blender. It's finicky. It's a little finicky. Is it being so finicky with me? These machines are really finicky. It's uh, being finicky. Now let's talk about grammar for a second because notice the sentence started with careful. Careful. Technically, you need the verb be. Be careful. Be careful. But native speakers will commonly drop verbs when they're not required to understand the sentence. So if I said to a native speaker, careful, they're not going to be confused because there's no verb be. They understand what it means without the verb. Careful, be careful, they're both correct and a native speaker will most likely just say careful. Let's try this again with another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. She's a finicky eater. She's a finicky eater. She's a finicky eater. I said, she's a finicky eater. This was easy for you, right? Because it's the same word, finicky, finicky. So hopefully you could clearly hear that now. But the meaning in this context is different. We're not saying she's an eater that requires a lot of attention to detail. A finicky eater is an eater who is difficult to please. Now, why would an eater be difficult to please? Because there are probably many things that she doesn't like or she has a lot of specific preferences about how her food is prepared. This adjective is commonly used to describe children because most children are finicky eaters. If you have kids, you can probably relate to this and you were once a child. So I don't know about you, but as for me, I was definitely a finicky eater when I was a kid. I only liked about five things and there was a long list of things I didn't like. If you can relate to that, put me too, me too in the comments, me too, so I know that you were also a finicky eater. Good luck with my finicky appetite. Let's try this again. I'll say this sentence three times. The audience was hanging on our every word. The audience was hanging on her every word. The audience was hanging on her every word. I said, the audience was hanging on her every word. For pronunciation, notice how on her sounds like honor, 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 because we frequently drop the H sound on her and then I connect those two words together, honor. I can also connect that with every, honor every, honor every, honor every. What does this mean? To hang on one's every word, this is an expression. And it means that you listen very closely, very attentively, very carefully. Now with expressions, you need to make sure you have every single word. So here, it's on her every word. So if you said the audience was hanging on her word and you forgot to use every, it wouldn't make sense because with expressions, you have to use every single word of the expression. So if you are listening to this lesson very closely, you're taking notes, you're actively participating, then you, my friend, are hanging on my every word. 
But if, as you're watching this video, you're also checking your email or making dinner or doing something else, then you're not hanging on my every word. So I hope you're hanging on my every word. If you are, put that in the comments. Jennifer, I'm hanging on your every word. And that means you're paying very close attention to what I'm saying. They're hanging on his every word. But he hangs on your every word. They all hang on my every word! Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. She has me wrapped around her finger. She has me wrapped around her finger. She has me wrapped around her finger. I said she has me wrapped around her finger. For pronunciation, notice wrapped. The ED is pronounced as a soft T. Wrapped. Wrapped, wrapped, wrapped around. Now, because I'm combining this with around, I can take that sound wrapped around, wrapped around, and I can combine them together. Remember I said we commonly get rid of the H sound on her. So I can do that here as well, and then I can connect it together. Wrapped arounder. To have someone wrapped around your finger, or we commonly say little finger, wrapped around your finger, wrapped around your little finger, there's no difference. So little is optional in this expression. And this is when you have complete control over someone. This happens in situations where perhaps this guy is totally in love with this girl and he's just infatuated with her. And because of that, she has complete control over him. And no matter what she says, he just does it. So he does her laundry for her. He drives her to work every day. She has him wrapped around her little finger. I have you wrapped around my finger in there, Tom. Please, I've got Dr. Reed wrapped around my finger. Boy, Archie, Veronica's got you wrapped around her little finger. Let's do this one more time. I'll say it three times. I can't get anything past you. I can't get anything past you. I can't get anything past you. I said, I can't get anything past you. For pronunciation, notice we have get anything. So we have a T between two vowels, so I can pronounce that as get anything, get anything, get anything, and then I'll combine those two sounds together. I can't get anything past you. Now what does this mean? To get something past someone, or you can also say to get something by someone, they're exactly the same, it's just an option, you can use past or by. This is when someone doesn't notice something important. But notice in my example, I can't get anything by you. I used it in the negative. Let's imagine an example. Let's say a customer is in a restaurant and that customer ordered an expensive bottle of French wine. But the restaurant tried to serve him cheap American wine. Now, because I can't get anything by you, it means that you notice the details when they're important. So it means that you noticed that this isn't the wine you ordered. And you'll say, wait, this isn't the wine I ordered. And then the waiter could say, I can't get anything by you. Can't get anything past this guy. Can't get anything past you, can I? Never could get anything past you, can I? Amazing job improving your listening skills of fast English and also adding these advanced expressions to your speech. Now let's improve your pronunciation. Let's do an imitation exercise. I'm going to say each sentence again three times 
and I want you to repeat each sentence out loud so you can imitate my pronunciation. Let's do that now. Careful with the blender, it's a little finicky. Careful with the blender, it's a little finicky. Careful with the blender, it's a little finicky. She's a finicky eater. She's a finicky eater. She's a finicky eater. The audience was hanging on her every word. The audience was hanging on her every word. The audience was hanging on her every word. She has me wrapped around her finger. She has me wrapped around her finger. She has me wrapped around her finger. I can't get anything past you. I can't get anything past you. I can't get anything past you. You have learned so much. Let's do one more round of listening tests. Our chances are slim to none. Our chances are slim to none. Our chances are slim to none. So, how'd you do? I said, our chances are slim to none. First, let's talk about the pronunciation changes. Notice that our, our, sounded like our, our, our chances, our chances. At a natural pace, we don't pronounce it our chances. We just do a very soft, unstressed our, our chances. Our chances. Our chances are. Notice that because chances ends on an S and R, it starts with a vowel, I can combine those together. Chances are. So it sounds like SAR, but I have to say those two words together. Chances are. Chances are. So when you hear it at a fast pace, you just hear the S from chances and you hear it both on chances and R. Our chances are. Slim to none, t, t. Notice that to none, again, is just a very soft, unstressed t. Slim to none, slim t, t, slim to none. What does this mean? First, let's talk about chances, one's chances. This is how possible something is. For example, the team has a great chance of winning. So here, their chance of winning, it's how possible it is that the team will win. The team has a great, so their chances of winning are quite high. But in this example, I said our chances are slim to none. What does that mean? Slim to none. This means very small or extremely unlikely. Our chances are slim to none. Now, I didn't specify chances of what in the original example. So I could say our chances of getting a promotion this year are slim to none. So this means it's very unlikely that you're getting a promotion. There's a chance. Yeah, slim to none. We slim to none. Oh, those are my chances. My chances of ever flying again are slim to none. Let's try another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. It was slim pickings at the career fair. It was slim pickings at the career fair. It was slim pickings at the career fair. I said, it was slim pickings at the career fair. For pronunciation, notice how pickings sounded quite unstressed. Pickings, ins. So I dropped that ing, I dropped that G sound from the ing. Pickin, 
picking, but it's plural, so I add that s. Pickens, pickens. Native speakers often drop the g sound or make it very soft with ing. Pickens, pickens. Listen to this clip and notice how Joey from Friends also drops the G and says it very unstressed, Pickens. It is slim Pickens. Yeah. You know, it is slim Pickens. Yeah. You know? Now let's talk about what this means. First of all, a career fair. Do you know what this is? This is an event where people looking for a job can meet potential employers. A career fair is very common for university graduates, college graduates, or high school graduates to go to to try to find a job. And I said it was slim pickings. So what does that mean? To be slim pickings? This is when there are very few good options to choose from. So maybe there were people at the career fair, but the employers that were there or the people looking for jobs that were there weren't the best quality. So you could say it was slim pickings. We commonly use these two words, slim pickings, if someone asks you how a search for something is going, so maybe you're looking for a new house, a new car, or of course, a job. So someone could say, how's the job search going? And then you can reply back and simply say, slim pickings, slim pickings. It's slim pickings out there. It is slim pickings. Oh. <laughs> are slim for an educated independent woman. Let's try this again with another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. Stop hogging the iPad. Stop hogging the iPad. Stop hogging the iPad. How'd you do with this one? I said stop hogging the iPad. Now here for hogging notice, we have I-N-G. So I did pronounce it more like hoggin, hoggin, hogging, ing, hoggin. So stressed, hogging, unstressed, hoggin. I tend to use both of them and don't really realize which one I'm using. I don't specifically choose before I'm about to speak which one I'm going to use, it's just whatever comes out and I will easily switch between the two, the stressed or the unstressed. Stop hogging, stop hogging. The iPad. Notice how it sounded more like a stressed the with that long e. We stress the and make it the when the noun that comes next starts with a vowel. iPad. I, of course, a vowel. Native speakers don't always follow this rule. I don't always follow this rule. I would commonly say the iPad, the iPad, the iPad. So if you use one or the other, or if you hear native speakers using one or the other, just know that both are acceptable and it's probably slightly more likely to use the stress version, the with a vowel, simply because it makes it easier to pronounce those sounds. So here's an iPad. What does it mean to hog the iPad? The iPad, the iPad. What does that mean? When you hog something, it means you take or use more than your fair share. So this is actually something I said to my husband Kevin the other day. I said, stop hogging the iPad because we only have one iPad and he was using it and I felt like he was using it more than his fair share. So I said, stop hogging the iPad because I wanted to use it. And I said this more in a joking way. But let's say that you have a roommate or you could think about someone you live with, a different family member or even a work colleague. And that person might use more of something or take more than their fair share. So maybe it takes your roommate a really long time to get ready, put on makeup in the morning, and you only have one bathroom. You might say, my roommate always hogs the bathroom in the morning. 
and it means your roommate uses more than her fair share of the bathroom. Notice in my original example, stop hogging the iPad, stop hogging. Our verb to hog is in the gerund form. That's because stop is a gerund verb, so you need stop plus verb ing. Stop hogging the iPad. That's why hog is in the gerund form with ing. Stop hogging my best friend. Stop hogging the blanket. Stop hogging the blanket. It's cold. Jean, how about we stop hogging the magazine, huh? Let's try one more listening exercise. I'll say it three times. Don't be stingy with the cheese. Don't be stingy with the cheese. Don't be stingy with the cheese. Did you get this one? I said, don't be stingy with the cheese. I think the pronunciation is clear, but do you understand what this means? And remember I said that, I said to my husband, stop hogging the iPad. Well, actually, this is something that he said to me. He said, don't be stingy with the cheese. So what does it mean to be stingy? This is when something is small in amount, less than expected. So I was putting cheese on something. I don't remember what. I'll say pizza. I was putting cheese on our pizza and my husband thought I was being stingy. I was using a small amount less than expected. But that was just his opinion because he likes a lot of cheese, whereas I don't like a lot of cheese. So in my opinion, I was not being stingy at all, but he thought I was being stingy. We have another meaning for stingy, which is very common. When you describe someone as stingy, it means they're unwilling to spend money. So they have the money, they just don't want to spend it. In that case, you would call someone stingy. For example, we had to take the bus because my friend was too stingy to take a taxi. This means that my friend had the money to take a taxi. So it wasn't financially difficult for her to take a taxi, but taking a taxi is more expensive than taking the bus and she's stingy so she doesn't like spending money so she took the bus so she could save her money because she's stingy. Although saving money and trying to save money can certainly be a positive thing, when we use this adjective it's always in a negative critical way. So we think that person should have been willing to spend the money if we describe them as stingy. I'm going to say to you, don't be stingy with your comments and don't be stingy with your likes. Now in this case, it's the first example I explained. When my husband said to me, don't be stingy with the cheese, he thought I wasn't using enough cheese. So don't be stingy with your comments. If you're stingy with your comments and your likes, it means you don't share them, you keep them to yourself. So it's another way of saying, make sure you comment. So put, I'm not stingy in the comments, put, I'm not stingy. And that means that you freely comment on my videos or you freely like my video. So don't be stingy, put that in the comments. Don't be stingy. I see, don't be stingy. He's even stingy with play money. <laughs> now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice your pronunciation. You can practice all the pronunciation changes that I explained in this video and you can imitate my pronunciation so you sound more natural. So I'm going to say each sentence three times and I want you to repeat the sentence out loud after each time. So let's do that now. Our chances are slim to none. Our chances are slim to none. 
Our chances are slim to none. It was slim pickings at the career fair. It was slim pickings at the career fair. It was slim pickings at the career fair. Stop hogging the iPad. Stop hogging the iPad. Stop hogging the iPad. Don't be stingy with the cheese. Don't be stingy with the cheese. Don't be stingy with the cheese. You did it! Amazing job! Think of how much you learned in this lesson. Now, did you enjoy this lesson? Do you want me to make more lessons just like this? If you do, then put let's go, put let's go in the comments so I know that you're ready. You're ready to keep improving your English, so put let's go in the comments. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And why don't you keep improving your English with this lesson right now? I know you'll love it.